I just want to start off briefly by say, by first of all, congratulating you on the update to the book. Um, I, it seems to be going up and down. I don't know if I have this placed badly. But, um, congratulations on the update to the book. Um, just about a year ago, uh, Eric and I had a conversation after he and Mark Glazer, who's the executive editor of PBS Media Shift, hatched this plan to take all the goodness that had been developed for searchlights and sunglasses and try to more broadly stimulate innovation in journalism education. It was a great conversation. It was about like 90 minutes, the two of us back and forth, back and forth. Um, and I um, can be accused of wearing rose-colored glasses. I'm a fairly optimistic person by nature. Pessimism just doesn't work for me. <laughs> kind of makes you stagnant. Um, and not in the good RJI is stagnant by helping people get better way. <laughs> uh, so I was saying to Eric, you know, I see a lot of really good things out there. And I think that EdShift could carry those things out to uh, more people. And um, I, what, one of the things that I was telling him was that I really got interested in digital communication during my grad studies because I got... I, I was challenged by code by when I first started learning HTML way back when I rode my dinosaur to Vilas Hall, that optimism really helped me. That's why I loved code, because I knew there was a way to make it work. You know, it was challenging you, and the pessimists would give up, but you know, code was just, it was so fixable. And one of the things that I learned in those early years when I was learning about um, design and user interfaces <laughs> was that people couldn't process lists more than nine items long, and so keep everything nine or less. So today, I would like to present uh, nine branches sprouting green shoots. <laughs> These are the things that I see as I went through the update to Searchlights and Sunglasses, along with the original, and all of the content that we've had on EdShift in the last year. Um, it formally launched in February, but we really started in November. Um, what are the kinds of things that we see that people can take and innovate in their own places. I'm going to be teasing you a little bit about some of the people who are going to be presenting today. It's going to be like teasing out the 6 o'clock news, even though I never worked in broadcast. Kent. So these are my nine shoots. But I will say, I think there are still some people in faculty meetings with rose-colored glasses on that really need to have them blasted off their faces. Everything's fine. We can just do it the way we've always done it. Nothing needs to change. So I'm not entirely rosy. <laughs> okay. So these are this. I love this is a perfect little bit of art to illustrate that it's not it's not all great, but there are some wonderful things happening. So I'm going to start with um, a quote from a good friend of mine, uh, Robert Hernandez at USC, Annenberg USC, um, who talks about going rogue respectfully. So I will use this to describe the people who are innovating within curricula that already exists. They're not fighting in subcommittees. They're not waiting for full approval. They're not looking to the dean for permission. But they're taking the structures that they already have and innovating within them. And that's the situation I'm in at Wisconsin. Um, we adopted a, a really broad brush curriculum in 2000, and it's allowed those of us who want to shake things up and experiment to do it pretty much any time we want to. Um, so this is Robert. Um, within the existing curriculum at USC right now, he's doing a class on um, developing for wearable technology in journalism. So that's him wearing Google Glass. And I can tell you it would take, in my institution, at least two years to get final approval for a class on developing technologies for journalism and wearables. By which time, Google Glass will be nothing anymore. Be, the, the next new thing will be there. So within the structures that we have, you have to find ways to move forward. Um, another one coming up later today is Jim Flink here at Missouri. I don't think it took any curriculum change for your multi-platform experiment, um, which was very, very exciting. Uh, I will confess to some envy at the access people have here at uh, Missouri to things like IRE and NICAR um, for these kinds of experiments. Not everybody has that opportunity, so you should really feel blessed. The next branch um, would be innovation centers and visitors to journalism programs. I think this is a really exciting infusion of energy into um, the places that we all work. So um, I am not compensated by Mary Ann Reed and West Virginia, uh, but they're going to pop up a couple of times in my talk because I think they're doing some really interesting things. So this is Zach Seward, who came in, was a visitor um, at West Virginia, and um, <coughs> excuse me and is part of 
this innovation series that they're doing. This also includes, this is my favorite um, image that we've run on EdgeShift this year. This is an illustration of Sarah Slobin from the Wall Street Journal, who came in um, as a visiting in in innovator in residence, there we go, sorry. Innovator in residence, and uh, she talked about bringing a touch of anarchy <laughs> to the program, about coming in as an outsider, dropping in and saying, hey, I don't have to worry um, about the long-term implications. I, am, I have freedom to do what I wanna do with this class, and they ended up with a tremendously successful project on uh, student prescription drug abuse, um, Ritalin, and, and that sort of thing being used to help students study, which, Incidentally, we also did a story on and how universities are beginning to look at that as academic misconduct. Uh, yes, that, the, that you're getting an unfair advantage, much like you would with plagiarizing someone else's material. So these people who can come in and bring their, their um, professional experience for short amounts of time can shake things up in new ways. Because when you pair professionals with amateurs, so when you take the seasoned veterans and you put them with the energy of 19 and 20 year olds, magic happens. Uh, so this is, um, uh, the, uh, Irving Washington is gonna talk a little bit later about the Challenge Fund for Innovation in Journalism Education. The Challenge Fund grantees are all um, doing these kinds of pro-am projects where they're working with professionals on a very specific live news experiment. This is Florida International University, which is just going great guns out of the gate. I get a little challenge fund nervous. Disclosure, I'm also a grantee. I get a little nervous when I see them in the Washington Post already, and we're just like, oh, wait, wait what, you know, what organizational tools are we using already? Uh, but they're doing a really cool thing on um, rising waters in South Florida and links to climate change. They're getting a lot of attention already, really, really active. So the combination in the challenge fund that I think is most powerful is that number one, it required you to work with a media partner, so you had that pro-am aspect. Uh, but number two, you get licensed to fail. <laughs> so as long as you fail and tell everybody exactly why and what happened, you're not in any trouble. That was a really liberating part of the challenge fund and I think a really good element to these pro-am projects. Sometimes, um, you feel very hemmed in. If it, if it isn't going to work, the media partner is going to be really unhappy. It was a liberating aspect to this. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't point to News 21, which I think um, really convinced many, many people, a lot of my own colleagues, uh, that student journalism, you can just hack off the student. It can be journalism. Incredibly, incredibly powerful. If you haven't seen what News 21 has done, I mean, oh, my gosh, the, pro the projects are just, just absolutely outstanding. This piece that they're doing on gun wars right now um, has influenced some of the investigative work we're doing in our own school. It is a, a tremendous, tremendous testament to what students can contribute um, to pub journalism in the public interest. Okay, if you're around me for three minutes and we're in the context of my talking about Wisconsin, you'll hear about cheese and the Green Bay Packers. People I had dinner with last night heard about both, okay? If you're around me in the context of journalism education for three minutes, I will proselytize about data. Um, it is simultaneously a green shoot and a vast wasteland. So I will argue to my death that any intro reporting course that does not include training in basic statistics and the use of spreadsheets and how to find, clean, analyze, and report on data is doing a disservice to students. It is every bit as important as interviewing um, in an intro reporting course. But there are places where there really are green shoots in this area. I would say intro courses are not one of them, but using professionals to um, drop in and teach courses um, in different schools is working very well. One of my favorite models, this is from Derek Willis of the New York Times. He um, does a course at Georgetown, and he has a really, really smart structure and he shares it with everybody. By the way, my slides are going to be available on the Green Shoot site, so you can go back and find any of these, but you can also just Google Derek Willis Georgetown and you'll come up with his GitHub. Um, what's that? And they're in the book. Oh, synergy, Eric. <laughs> yes, so, um, so this is a really smart structure. He does incredibly sophisticated work for the New York Times completely understands the mind of an undergraduate. It's really, it's, a, it's an excellent structure. 
Um, I also think, also in the book, um, uh, the amount of open source data tools that are available for projects very small and very large um, is significant. This is follow the money. If you look on um, EdShift this week, we ran two pieces on the update to searchlights and sunglasses and how you might take some of what's in the book and transform it. Um, one of my teaching assistants, Mallory Perryman, a graduate of the University of Missouri School of Journalism, <coughs> excuse me, wrote both pieces. She's an outstanding instructional designer. So she took some insights from the book and turned them into assignments that you can then um, adapt and use in your own courses. So the amount of data that's available to us today makes, these, makes this kind of working classes so much easier. One of the toughest parts of working with data is cleaning it, and you now have access to clean data sets to use in assignments like, like you never did before. Okay, social journalism. I am so happy that we have finally left behind, or most of us have left behind, this idea that we need to teach social media. So uh, uh, one of our prominent alumni asked me if I taught Twitter. And I said, no, I don't teach Twitter because I never taught newspaper. You open it, this is a headline, this is the story, this picture is in black and white, this picture is in color. That's not the way that we do it. We teach journalism using social tools. And so the transformation of teaching social media to teaching social journalism is a really, really important move in my mind. So I think many of you already know that CUNY um, has, is launching a brand new master's degree um, in social journalism. There's a, I would encourage you to read about it. They've got some great um, ideas. It's worth assigning students to just take a look at the structure of it because just looking at what they're doing helps you understand what is meant by social journalism. There's another uh, challenge fund um, project at, it's at CUNY, right, with public housing? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Didn't want to have a fact error if any of my students are watching on the live stream. Um, so uh, an example of social journalism in this project, there's a big issue with um, mold in New York City public housing. There's a legal case, but really no data, very little evidence to back it up. So the CUNY team is working with the New York Post as a media partner to use social tools. Now, in some cases that might be Twitter, in some cases it might be Facebook. It can also be text messaging into a database to gather information and images um, about mold problems in public housing so that they can begin to analyze it and produce a real picture of what's going on. That's using social tools in journalism. But you can also do very, very basic assignments. So, sorry, this isn't your tiger. This is the Memphis tiger. <laughs> <laughs> We have a badger, which I, most people would say a tiger would eat, but I think the badger would win. Anyway, <laughs> so Carrie Brown Smith, who's now at CUNY but was at Memphis, uh, created this, um, this sort of crowdsourced uh, social journalism exercise with a, with a Twitter scavenger hunt. And so there are now many, many schools that participate in this. Some of them do it within the same confined week so that they share a hashtag, uh, but other schools just take that model and run it on, like us, <laughs> run it in their own week when it fits within your overall course structure. But it has students out looking for very basic things on their own campuses. Um, in our case, you know, they go to iconic places and capture pictures, but they also go and start to do basic interviewing on the street to find out about an upcoming referendum, for instance, um, or a response to a Supreme Court decision on voter ID in our state. So there are different elements to the scavenger hunt that you can you can adapt to your own needs. So I used to have this director um, in the journalism school who, started, who became director right after I became director. And um, he, said, he said, what do you think is the biggest problem facing us? And I said, it's all about the money, honey. And then he later told me that that was a Ry Cooter song lyric? Anyway, I don't know. I don't know who Ry Cooter even is. Um, but to me, money has been a problem. We've had incredible um, budget challenges, I'm sure you have as well. State support for public higher education in Wisconsin has gone down. We're happy that, that alumni donations have increased and helped fill the gaps a little bit, but money is very challenging when you're trying to buy equipment, when you're trying to ensure that students who don't have resources at home still are in your journalism program because that's who we need. But I think money is a green shoot. So. 
This is my favorite thing of the month of October, um, which is um, the University of Georgia, in their uh, foundation, their fundraising um, donor arm, has created this Kickstarter-like um, interface. And by a year from now, I really, really hope University of Wisconsin has the same thing. Um, I don't know if any of you have tried Kickstarter, but it presents lots and lots of problems if you work within, uh, especially a public institutional structure. Um, getting the money transferred is very, very difficult. You can't use it for this reason or that. Um, so Georgia created their own. And um, it, this isn't just for journalism. It's for engineering students who want to try to create a car that runs on cooking oil or that sort of thing. Um, but in this case, this is an instructor named uh, Mark Johnson, who does really great work, uh, multimedia work, really smart instructional designer. He, um, was, he had this uh, advanced photography class where they go and they do a project. This year it was at the Georgia State Fair, and he said, I need $1,000 to be able to get them there. And so he put it up on a crowdfunding site and very quickly uh, surpassed it. The nice part about this is that you don't need to be focused exclusively on that big donor who can give you a major grant that creates an innovation center for you or endows a professional in residence. In this case, mom and dad can give 50 bucks so that Brittany can go and cover the Georgia State Fair. So it's a way you can be more nimble in funding specific ideas that you have. I would say it's also a barometer for when you have a good idea or a bad idea. Something that's not fundable may not be the thing that you should be going after. And that's an important insight for students to, to grasp. Okay, also specific amounts of money to stimulate students to do certain things. This is from Ohio University. They've been very invested in entrepreneurship. They created the Scripps Innovation Challenge. It's a $10,000 prize. Uh, every year. Roger, I meant to mention this, these guys to you last night um, because they tie into your challenge fund program. They created an algorithm that analyzed um, traffic, uh, Twitter traffic among followers of the Columbus Dispatch, uh, the various Columbus Dispatch accounts, so that they could find clusters and um, help the Columbus Dispatch target um, specific stories to specific groups. So they're actually trying, they won the challenge with their model and they're actually now trying to develop this. It's a pretty exciting project. Not all journalism students. Uh, five years ago, the thing in journalism that I was most critical about, journalism education that I was most critical about, um, and Eric and I have had debates about the teaching hospital model, uh, because my, I, my part of my professional background includes some work in academic medicine. And my argument is that the teaching hospital model does not work without continuing medical education. That's what drives it. And I would say the same thing is happening in journalism education. We have to have training. My university put forward this wonderful curriculum that I'm a huge fan of, put it into place without one dollar to train any faculty member to adapt within it. Not one dollar. Now, they caught up, they changed, <laughs> they found some, some ways to make it work. But if you're going to say, please go, innovate, change, grow, and you're not going to give anybody opportunities for training, that to me is a non-starter. I mean, yes, you have people who will self-train, but they also have competing priorities, okay? They, they're trying to publish for tenure or they're trying to maintain creative work um, in the field. So good things that are happening in training. I would say primarily um, Pointer is very dedicated to journalism education. They've identified two strategic priorities um, uh, for the coming years. One of them is education. So <clears throat> News U, this is just one example. They have a digital tools catalog where they're constantly adding tools of the day and trying to keep up. Um, that's uh, partnered a partnership of Pointer, Knight, and API. Really, really smart stuff. Very short, contained little training modules that you can, can work into your day. They also do in-person training that I highly recommend, but a disclosure, I also do work with Pointer and do some of their training, so I'm not trying. Yeah. The ethicist will say the word disclosure about 17,000 times in the average presentation. Okay, also, um, here's West Virginia again. Um, these hackathons that have started to happen in journalism are really exciting. Um, these small groups of people who get together and try to innovate around a particular subject. So West Virginia and Disclosure Media Shift uh, just wrapped up a really exciting hackathon on the gender gap. And this is something that troubles me a lot. Um, the same trend that we see in computer science and lots of STEM areas 
with um, female students sort of dropping off the tracks as they get increasingly technological, we're also seeing in journalism schools, it's not well documented, it's anecdotal, but there are fewer students who show up for classes, in, fewer female students who show up for classes in, in coding and advanced um, online design and that sort of thing. So West Virginia and Mark Glazer had this idea to just sort of hack their way around that and it was, I don't know if you're gonna talk about it later, but it was tremendously successful. Um, Media Shift is also partnering with RJI I'm talking a lot about media shift, but is also partnering with RJI to do a series of webinars. Some will be specifically targeted at um, educators, but I think all will be applicable to educators, and those will be rolling out um, in the coming months. If you told me a year ago that I would be standing in front of a group of journalism educators and saying anything positive about whole programmatic change, I would have said you were high. Like there is no, the, like, I mean, come on, how many really great curricula do we see? But uh, Heather Chaplin's gonna get up here a little later and she's gonna talk to you about this thing that I am sick, twisted, excited about, which is journalism plus design at the new school. Um, I, I'm a design junkie, a horrible designer, but a really, really passionate person about thinking about design and focusing on the user. So this is, to me, a really exciting development. A brand new program, six, eight weeks old. How many? Eight weeks? Eight weeks old. So you're hearing it right on the um, ground floor. Also, uh, Cindy Royal at Texas State has just gotten through the first level um, of, of approvals for a brand new side curriculum um, in journalism innovation. So not replacing the whole cloth of the journalism program curriculum, but creating something, um, a track that will work for students. Um, she just finished a night fellowship at Stanford and this is a, an image from um, a site that she's creating specifically about teaching code for journalism called Code Actually. Sorry, I needed, I knew I would catch up at some point. Uh, CodeActually.com, I think, is it's a, it's a work in progress, but, but that's another thing that she's doing. So two examples of nimble approaches that are whole curriculum in nature. I really don't, would not have predicted that that sentence was going to come out of my mouth uh, because a lot of people really are stuck in trying to figure out um, how to move forward. And then my ninth, and I think most important um, <clears throat> development or branch reason that green shoots are sprouting is we've gotten so much better at sharing what we're doing. I, I might call this the Mindy McAdams model. Where is Diane? Oh, there you go. <laughs> um, Mindy is the night chair um, at Florida. And um, Mindy was hugely influential in the early part of my career because she opened up everything she did to anyone who wanted it so that they could take it and do what they needed with it. Um, her blog is a must read, her, her tweets are all smart. Um, she just has always been a great sharer. And I think that's a really important model. So you can use social tools to find solutions to your everyday teaching problems. ONA educators on Facebook, um, Pointer, every one of their seminars has a Facebook group where sharing happens. Um, so this is Kelly Fincham who's saying, I want to create some sort of repository of data viz tools. What am I missing? Post it. And this, this, this goes on for about three pages. And all sorts of people add different things that they would change or um, suggest for her, um, for her free tools thing. Now, there is a danger of being part of any of these groups, and that is you'll often see a comment from Katie Culver that says, hey, how would you like to write about this <laughs> for EdShift? <laughs> yeah, Mark, Mark Johnson at Georgia <laughs> one time responded in a chat saying, saying everybody be quiet. Don't say anything innovative or Katie will make you write about it. Just the sky is very gray in Georgia today. That's all I'm saying. Uh, but you can use these tools to share what you know and also to, to find the answers to the problems that you have. And not like I haven't gone here before, but I'm gonna go there now. <coughs> and that is to say, I do think EdShift, I think the idea that Eric and Mark Glazer had a year ago was a really, really profound idea. And that was that change is possible, but you have to give people the information they need to be able to do it. In that 90 minute phone call, Eric um, called out a phrase that has been my sort of, it's been my moniker ever since. The thing that's always in my mind every time I think about assigning or editing a story or deciding on a chat topic, and that is, 
that EdShift should be solutions journalism for educators. And that's, I think, what it has been. <coughs> now, when, it's, when I first was working with Mark and deciding how this might look, I said, you know, I think if we do, if we focus on sharing, if we focus on taking <coughs> course designs or assignment designs and putting them out so that other people can adapt them, I think we can move the needle in the right direction. So actually, that'd be this direction to me, but that direction to you. So I think we can move the needle and have more people striking out and trying to, um, trying to adapt and innovate. So it's a seriously niche market, right? <laughs> it's what, 400 and some journalism programs. This wasn't, you know, this was like, okay, we're gonna reach a few people. And there was also a real worry about preaching to the choir. Like who was going to be coming to EdShift? Was it gonna be all the people who are doing this stuff already? Um, or were we gonna actually reach people beyond? So I'm delighted to report that last month's numbers, we had 55,000 uniques in September, which is more than 500% growth in education traffic. So you niche people aren't looking so nichey. I mean, we didn't move the needle, we bent the sucker. I mean, it's like, <laughs> and to me, that's the greenest shoot of all, that people are taking these remix pieces. So here's Mallory, the delight. She's a little stretched. I need to fix her image. Um, so Mallory is saying, how do you get students interested in data journalism? She's taking this little open source tools um, idea from Searchlights and Sunglasses and providing stimuli for why students should care about this and assignments that you can adapt. And these things have been really popular where people can take a syllabus, a course design, an assignment, and make it their own in their own program because you know we all have different different things that we're trying to do so it's not all rosy though i think those are important trends i think those are good developments i think those are really admirable people behind every one of those you know it's not just innovations it's innovators <laughs> people who are willing to take risks people who really identify with the work those are you know they have these common traits but I still think we are um, in some significant ruts. Uh, widespread curriculum innovation, lots of schools doing the kinds of things that Heather is doing or Cindy is doing. I don't see that. I think that we are too bound um, to some of our legacies and traditions and we need to think about whether that's really serving our students and really serving the public through journalism. Um, I also think, um, I will limit it to my own context and experience, but I also think we're kind of bad at holding each other's feet to the fire in making accountability a real part of what happens in our departments. So, you know, it's very, very easy for some new instructor or assistant professor to come in and within a structure do a little bit of rebellion and, you know, try to go rogue respectfully, right? But who is looking, you know, is she rewarded for doing that within the structures that you have set up? Um, if somebody else is not doing that, is teaching this, a course the exact same way they taught that reporting course 20 years ago, does that person face any accountability or is that person rewarded for other things? I think accountability is a really important issue for faculty to wrestle with. Um, there are also things that happen with the institutional structures that make bringing professionals in very difficult, especially if you're in a place where, um, you know, Missouri journalism is what, the 800 pound gorilla on campus, that's not always the case. So if you are in a place where engineering is the big dog, you will see recognition that professionals should be incorporated as part of curricula. It's totally normal. But if you're in a really humanities focused um, arena, you might not see that same recognition. It's kind of like, what? what? Is that person just gonna come and tell war stories about her career? No, we don't care about that. As I mentioned before, I do think data is a weakness, particularly at the introductory level. Um, if you have one course in advanced data journalism, that's just not enough. And if that course is undersubscribed, I'll tell you why, because you didn't get anybody excited about the idea when they were young and fresh. Um, I think design is a weakness across journalism curricula. Um, you know, we, talk, we do, I think we do an admirable job saying we need to focus on audience, but focusing on audience with that sort of user orientation that I know Heather will get to, um, I think we could do better. We can always do better on code, but I'm sick of the journalism sh schools should teach code. No, they shouldn't. Yes, they should. No, they shouldn't. Let's just be done. Let's instead ask, 
How could they do it effectively? Even if you think maybe they shouldn't, are there ways in which they could, they could do it? And then I also think we're really bad <laughs> at taking the research that we have worked so hard um, to do and taking that out to the profession and also incorporating it in our own darn classes. A course on social journalism should definitely include training on the hostile media effect. This incredibly robustly researched concept that has an impact every single day, and yet we don't talk about it as much as we should. So I'm gonna circle all the way back to Robert Hernandez and his and my favorite um, graphic, and the reason that I was just such a fan of the green shoots metaphor from the beginning. The minute I heard it come out of Randy's mouth, I was like, oh, that's the best title ever. Why? Because it's about growth. It's about the fact that we aren't, as educators, just who we are and doing what we do. That's not what we must be. We must be engaged in constant growth. People talk about change, disruptive change, constant change is the new normal. Again, fairly optimistic Katie Culver, I would instead frame that as the opportunity for growth is there every single day. You get up in the morning and you get to change. That's a good thing, change isn't put upon you. Who wants to do the same job for 20 years? That's what I don't get. That's what I don't get about some stagnant classes. Why in the world would you wanna teach the same thing over and over again? It just bores me to tears. But that means that a teacher always has to be a learner. A teacher always has to be focused on what I can do to improve, to, to better this relationship with students because there's this great old quote from a book that a teacher affects humanity. He never knows where his influence ends. That's true. I've got 21 kids in my magazine class this semester, and I charge them up. I get them ready. I do, you know, we're constantly engaged um, in this shared enterprise. And then they go out into the world, and they do good things. Now, if I'm teaching that magazine class the same way I taught it a dozen years ago, I just don't think it's as rich. I just don't think that relationship is as effective. So I do consider myself a lifelong learner, and I think every one of those innovators that, I've, that I have touched on is the exact same way. You know, Robert Hernandez gets up in the morning, I'm convinced, and goes, what's cool? <laughs> he's just, he's ready, he's out there, he's feeling it out, what's out there that he can, that he can get his hands on, and how can he translate that um, into teaching for his students? So I am positive about the green shoots. These aren't the only people out there. The hardest thing about doing this presentation was knowing the time limit and that there were people who I was going to leave out, okay? And some of them, I'm sure, are watching on the live screen and saying, live stream and you know, Steve Fox is at UMass going, hey, you didn't talk about my interactive investigative journalism class. So there, there's my drop in. <laughs> um, poor Steve, he's a good friend who writes a lot for Edgeshift, so don't wanna tick him off. Um, so there are many, 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 many more. And the great part is, Every single one of them is into sharing. If you email Cindy Royal today, Google for Cindy Royal Texas State, and say, hey, I wanna learn more about your media innovations curriculum, she will send you back a link to a Google Doc that says, here, here you go, it's you know, view only, please let me know if you have any questions. It's that collaborative spirit that's part of innovation, and I think that's probably the greenest and biggest shoot of all. So with that, and I finished on time, ha. <laughs> which is very unusual for Katie Culver. <laughs> so thank you very much, everybody, and I'm delighted you're all here.